Welcome, everybody. I appreciate you for joining in and listening. Uh, if you're in real time, uh, great to be with you right now on this great day. If you're listening to this um, on the recording, I appreciate you guys tuning in and, and listening to some of this great content. My name is Justin Peters. I will be moderating the conversation today. I am with uh, the organization Be Present. We also have our, our founder here, Abby Westerman. She is behind the scenes. She'll be running the Q&A, so um, feel free to say hi to her in the Q&A. Um, but if, uh, the purpose of this webinar today, if, uh, whether you're hearing, you know, the news for the first time, you're in the middle of your own cancer experience, or you're trying to figure out what the next steps are after treatment for you, we hope this web webinar provides some clarity for some of those questions. We're going to cover a lot of different topics here. We have three amazing panelists, um, that represent, uh, all different varieties and can have different perspectives here. So um, our goal is just to take some of the mystery out of what's ahead and to open the door to some conversations that you may be struggling to start and ultimately help facilitate some stronger connection between you and your loved ones as you ask for or offer support. So a few housekeeping items before we kick off this conversation. If you have questions, feel free to use the Q&A. Um, we will have a Q&A session at uh, the end of this conversation. And any questions that didn't get addressed during that conversation, we'll address them at that time. And then um, this session will also be recorded. So if you're listening to this in real time, you want to re-listen or share it with somebody, it's got to be it, a link will be provided on our site for you um, to either continue watching at your leisure or, like I said, share it with somebody that uh, uh, might find this interesting. So I'm going to kick things off, um, introduce our panel here. We do have a lot of really great panelists that bring three unique perspectives. So I'm really excited about that. Stephen Galgarakis is our first panelist. He is an AYA cancer survivor and advocate. So Stephen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, so happy that you're all here uh, today or listening in on the recording. As you said, my name is Stephen Galarakis. I am not only a cancer survivor, but I am a four-time cancer survivor. I had my first cancer when I was 15. That was osteosarcoma. My second cancer at 18 my third cancer and fourth cancer just a year and a half ago in 2019. But along that way, I've been an advocate for adolescent young adult cause along with cancer patients in general, and just trying to help all of you and all of our friends and family make this journey a, a little bit easier. So thank you, Justin, for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And you also might notice similar last name, another one of our panelists, Nick. He is the sibling of Stephen, also a supporter and has supported uh, Stephen throughout his cancer experience. Nick, welcome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us tonight. Uh, you know, a little bit of myself, obviously, Steve's brother, that that kind of sums up the relationship on how I'm tied to cancer world. Um, but also, um, I'm the executive director of the Stephen G. Cancer Foundation, which is also uh, the the owner, if you will, of Elephants and Tea, uh, the, the brand uh, Elephants and Tea, which is a nonprofit media arm of our foundation uh, to help bring community and support to the AYA space for patients and survivors to tell their own stories and their own words. So uh, we're in it from a family standpoint, but also from a professional standpoint as well. So just happy to be here. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for, for being with us. And our final panelist, Kara Nosgoff health professional and AYA survivor advocate herself. Kara, can you introduce yourself? Of course. Hi, I'm Kara, and I worked as a AYA child life specialist with 14 to 26 year olds at a children's hospital for several years, um, where I sat at the bedside with many teens and young adults, uh, hearing their story and, and providing that support as they navigated their, their cancer experience through diagnosis to survivorship, and really developed a passion for this age group and um, helping them cope with the hospital experience and the cancer experience, um, which led me to where I am now as the hospital Hospital Programs and Services Manager at Teen Cancer America, where our mission is to come alongside a hospital and really create change. We're working to blur the line between pediatric and adult hospitals and 
build comprehensive AYA programs by supporting dedicated personnel and, and really just helping them see outside the box of, of how to uh, provide care and support for this age group. Awesome. I'm really excited to talk to all three of you today. You guys have great, um, you guys have great perspectives. I think you're going to share a lot with the audience today. As I mentioned, we have a lot to cover in this. We broke this webinar down into three major topics. Our first topic for the day will be how cancer impacts young adults, the common misconceptions uh, people have, and what is ahead. The second topic for our conversation today is how to how clear and honest two way communication improves connection and support. And our third topic for the day will be how to organize support that is meaningful and consistent over time. And then, as I mentioned, we will have a Q&A session at the end to address any audience questions. So please be interactive with us, drop your questions in, say hello, um, clap for things that you really enjoy. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, Please feel free to, to interact with us as much as you want. So um, before we jump into the conversation, we're gonna set the stage, kick things off, we're gonna show a short video. Um, it's a great short by Hernan Baranga. Um, he is a cancer survivor and creator of My Friend Has Cancer, a six part series. This In this first episode, you'll hear some survivors and their supportive friends share their experience and their perspective on how young adults can better support their friends who are going through cancer. So let's take a look at the video. My name is Ben Andrews, and I grew up with my best friend here, Justin Burke-Bickler. My name is Court. I'm from Philadelphia, and I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma. My name is Maria. I'm Janelle. Dakota Fisher-Vance. And I was diagnosed with familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP for short. My name is Jessica Craig. And this is my best friend, Renee Shamil. When you get a cancer diagnosis, when you're an adolescent or a young adult, you're just completely unprepared. Especially if you've been healthy prior to that, you sort of have no frame of reference. At the same time, your friends are totally unprepared. It's new for all of us. I was 16 when I was diagnosed and my friends were really absent. Probably during treatment, I had maybe four friends visit me once. I spent a lot of time alone or with like the folks in the hospital, you know? I never really had any time to react to what was happening. I always say I just had time to act because there was a lot of things that I was trying to manage all one time while also keeping up with my job and relationships and all the medical stuff. I think I was just so overwhelmed and I got so focused on making decisions, starting with the surgery, what am I gonna do, and getting testing done, and just all of these things. You kind of go into that survival mode. We got a call, and my parents took it, and this is what happened, but it was sort of this odd situation of like me playing a board game with my friend, but like knowing that I think I have this disease, and like, it was like, how do I like continue playing this board game with this friend, and like maintain a straight face, and, from that moment on, I think I realized this is gonna be, I'm not gonna know how to socialize with my friends anymore. <laughs> I didn't even tell anybody that I was going for the biopsy, um, but Jess was one of the only people I told. And you didn't tell me things that you weren't sure of, like, oh, you're fine, you're fine, which even the doctors had said to me. And you didn't judge me. I mean, I even had doctors judging me, but my best friend never judged me. I tried to approach it open-minded. I know um, when you were saying you weren't gonna do chemo, I was worried, but if that's the best for you, then that's the best for me, because I'm there to support you. I mean, we've always been close. When Justin had cancer, that didn't change too much, but now I guess I, I value our friendship more. Those days when you're, you had said like your, your white cell count had dropped, those were kind of scary times. Lindsay's mom had reached out to my mom, and that's how I found out that Lindsay was sick, and we talked about it, kind of like a what the heck is happening situation. But it was crazy town over there, um, just doctor's visits, new chemo, losing hair. Her parents knew that I wanted to be there, and I wanted to help. And I think maybe they thought I would be helping her, 
more than she would be helping me, but that was never my thought. I knew Lindsay was gonna help me. No one can get through anything without friends. There is a lot of research that shows that people whose friends stick with them, people who have more support from their friends do better. They're better able to cope with cancer. And it's so, so important for friends to hang in there. I needed people to like hear my voice and just sit there and like, and just let me talk and, you know, and be there and, and sort of pull me out of that isolation a little bit, I guess, as well. Although you want to be sensitive of the disease and act accordingly, you also don't want to treat them any differently as well. Your friend that's diagnosed with cancer is still the exact same person. For example, like the cancer was there before you knew about the diagnosis and you were probably still friends then and that nothing changes now. It just, maybe we look a little different or maybe we're a little more tired, but we're the same person. And if they could be aware of that, that would be a game changer. There's gonna be a lot of awkwardness. There's gonna be a lot of awkward moments and missteps. And the point is not perfection, it's perseverance. Hang in there with your friends because that's what friendship is about. It's, it's a new normal for the time being. And it might seem like you know, a week of the friendship or a month or however long treatment is going wrong, but try to think bigger picture is what kind of person do you want to be for that patient. Having cancer made me realize the people that I had close to me, how important those relationships were, and they just weren't people who I did something that I happened to like doing. It was, it meant more than that. It was deeper than that. So think about what are some practical things that you know that you can do that would be helpful to your friend with cancer? So I think that video sets a really good stage for this conversation and the overall mission and goal here at Be Present. Um, so I'm excited to get into our first topic for this evening. As I was mentioning, it's going to be how cancer impacts a young adult and really the path ahead. So Kara, I'd love to start with you. Um, you've, had to see, you've had a chance to see a broad spectrum of AYA cancer experiences in your work. Can you share with us some of the common themes or misconceptions about the AYA cancer experience? Yeah, um, I think to start, I would, you know, just want to let everyone know that AYA stands for adolescents and young adults, and it's a term that we use quite a bit um, in the U.S., and it represents 15 to 39-year-olds that have been diagnosed with cancer, and so that's really this audience that we're talking about are these teens and young adults that have um, been impacted by cancer, and I think it's important to paint the picture of you know, what's happening at that age stage. So there's a lot of different milestones within that age group. Um, they're in high school, they're going off to college, they're, you know, taking their SATs, they're gaining that independence, they're moving out of their homes for the first time, um, they're dating, they're, you know, interning and, and having their first job. Um, some are starting a family. Uh, you know, there's a really wide, um, life stage within that age range. And so when you then a cancer diagnosis enters in, um, that really impedes that, that growth and, um, and, and makes a big impact when people are starting to launch out of their home and, and find their identity and get that independence for the first time. And then you realize that you've been diagnosed with cancer and, and a lot of that is taken away. And so you have to move back home or you have to depend on other people. Um, you feel like your life is being put on hold while everyone around you is still going to school and dating and getting that dream job and and starting a family and so it can be really um isolating and um and really just a, an attack on your emotional health that that takes a lot of strength to watch everyone on instagram you know going to football games and and getting married and doing all of these things and you it's a really a, a big mental battle to see all of that and to um 
to to see that you're on a different path and and to know that this your path is going to look a little differently and so to cope with that you really need the right people in place and you need the right tools to help you cope with that um i think a few things that stand out um you know i think when you get older, your friends are really your biggest support network. Your family's there, you love your family, but but friends hold such a, a big place in your life during that phase. Um, and so I think friends don't always know how to, um, to be supportive during the cancer experience, which we'll be talking about more later. But I think, um, you know, missing friends, missing uh, school work and, and all of those experiences are, are really heavy. Um, I also think another misconception that comes up often is um, as soon as treatment ends, we kind of think, okay, they're done and, and I'm going to get my friend back or, you know, everything's going to go back to normal. And it really doesn't. It's a, you know, we call it the new normal, which can get annoying sometimes, but um, it really is. It's this opportunity to, um, you know, take a step back and think about what do I want for my future and, and how am I going to reintegrate back into school and work and it is this feeling of starting over. And so again, another opportunity for your family and friends to step in and help with that transition. And if you've been consistent throughout the cancer treatment and, and um, through diagnosis into remission, then that transition won't be as challenging. Um, but I think maintaining those relationships during treatment and then into survivorship um, is really important. And then I think about, um, you know, considering the long-term effects and, and the, you know, we'll get into a little later about treatment and, and the effect that it has on their well-being. Um, I think being mindful of, you know, each person's experience is very different and in the way that they respond to treatment. Um, and so um, I think thinking about that and then just in general, you know, whether you're treated, if you're 15 to 39, you're either going to fall into the pediatric side or you're going to fall into that, that adult side. Um, and recognizing that the, the treatment and the support and the resources are very different um, on each side. And, um, and so I think it's just important to be aware of this age group, um, not only you know, in that life stage, are they going through something different, but then the health system isn't really built for that age group either. We lost your sound, Justin. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Stephen, I don't know if any of that rang true for you, but um, how did your cancer diagnosis impact you during your first uh, your first cancer? Well, so okay, so I'm I'm 30 years old now. I was 15 when my first cancer uh, appeared. It was in the sophomore year of my high school. Sophomore year of high school, and. Uh, you know, it was a, uh, it was kind of a slow progression to my diagnosis in the sense where I slow over the course of two months. And so there was, you know, kind of a, it was everyone, all my friends were, first of all, were shell shocked. Like most of your friends are, they're very surprised, you know, that you have this diagnosis. But for me, it was this, I was missing school because I was having pain uh, for about a couple of months. And then, you know, people were kind of joking that, you know, he's just being a wimp, da, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. And then obviously not being a wimp with a softball size <laughs> and 60 nodules in my lungs, you know? And so it was more of this, um, sense of, Oh crap. We, what, you know, what do we do? How do we, how do we act? How do we be around this person that, you know, is entirely different now that we don't see anymore. And, you know, in terms of misconceptions and, you know, uh, the things that we all think of, you know, we think that, you know, someone gets diagnosed with cancer and they're going to have no hair like, immediately. You know, I remember coming back to school a week after I was first diagnosed and all my friends had shaved their heads and I still had long curly hair, <laughs> you know, and so that was a really wonderful thing. But in terms of, you know, kind of what Kara spoke to, yeah, it's a really uh, bizarre, bizarre time and you know, no one knows what to say. You know, everyone says, is it okay if we ask you how you're doing? And, you know, at the end of the day, even as a four-time cancer survivor, I don't know what to say to people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so expecting a 15 year old boy or girl, you know, to know what to say to their friend uh, is, 
it's just not going to happen. But what helped me so much, you know, through my initial diagnosis was I had, you know, I had a lot of friends, but I had, I had a core group of friends that were really there. And then I had one friend who was really almost there for everything, kind of like just in the video where each person had their special friend that was there with them. My, my friend was uh, my good friend, Gabby, who was just, she'd come talk my ear off, you know, and it was just a nice um, break from the world. And that was really the things that kind of helped me the most with that time period was having a friend come over and just getting a break from, you know, everything and just hearing about regular life. But it was, you know, uh, as well, uh, hard to sit there and watch your friends go do things. And, you know, I remember getting a call one time on, on New Year's Eve saying, where are you at right now? I was in a bed. I was in a hospital bed. You know, I was like, well, this is where I'm at, man. Where do you think I am? I haven't been anywhere else, really. You know, and so those moments sucked, but, you know, it, I think that happens at, that has happened at all four stages of, of my cancer experience, as I put it now, you know, it's, so you know, I'm not sure if that really answers the question or not, but yeah, I, that was kind I of, I think, I think that really sets the stage and I, I'm, I'm assuming, um, Nick can come in and give his perspective, Nick, hopefully, um, you weren't one of those guys saying, that Stephen was being a wimp, but you can admit it if you if you are. Um, but how did Stephen's cancer diagnosis impact you and, and your family? Yeah, so it's interesting because I was in college uh, when Steve was diagnosed with cancer. We're five years apart, so I was sophomore in college, and right, yeah, sophomore in college. Steve was a sophomore in high school, and so um, personally, first for me, you know, I think Steve hit it on the head where someone's diagnosed with cancer and immediately it's like, you know, no hair or they look like crap or whatever the case might be. Right. Or everyone's super sad. And um, I remember coming home from college uh, and Steve was in the hospital immediately. I think he started his treatments pretty quickly. Um, and I was expecting to walk in and, and, you know, kind of like, you know, who's sad, who's what. And of course, I think I hit one of my parents in the hallway first. And of course they saw me and got emotional um, but then walking into the, the room, I think the first thing Steve said to me was making fun of my weight or something uh, at the time. So uh, the, that, that, I think that sounds pretty accurate, right, Steve? <laughs> so, you know, so it was hilarious that obviously I walked into the room and was the emotional one. And Steve was the one kind of putting the smiles on people's faces, uh, which most people, I think, outside of the cancer community are like, what do you mean the cancer patients, the one making people smile? But I think we hear that more than people want to admit um, that it just impacts everybody differently. So me personally, off the bat, you know, really didn't know what the heck to expect. I didn't know what malignant versus benign meant um, when they were talking about what type of tumor it could have been, you know, really was a deer in the headlights off being a 20, 21 year old in college, you know, you know, you don't really know at the time. Um, as far as my family, you know, and our family in general, we pretty, we circled around Steve, I felt like pretty quickly. Um, we were, we are a pretty tight knit family, our immediate five. Um, and, you know, I think this just brought us closer. Uh, and, and that's just my take on it. But, you know, our family didn't shy away, even our extended family, for the most part, I never felt like anybody um, didn't come see Steve or didn't approach Steve. So we're fortunate that for better, or for worse, the big fat Greek family really came through in a lot of different ways for us. Um, so yeah, you know, we're, we and Steve, you know, I say we being the siblings, you know, our family was there for me and Phil, our older brother, as much as they were there for Steve, I felt like too. Yeah, I'd be curious um, in our audience as well. I should have probably kicked things off this way, but um, I would love to know how you're related to cancer. If you're a survivor, a supporter, a health professional, I think um, I already see some some fun banter going along in in the the chat right now. But that'd be really helpful. So if you can chime in and just kind of tell me um, how you're how you were impacted by cancer, that that really helps shape this conversation moving forward. Um, but looking at what's ahead after the diagnosis. Um, Steven, maybe you can touch on this a little bit. I, someone, it, if there's somebody in the audience that recently heard um, of their friend having a cancer diagnosis or themselves, what can be some of their expectation moving forward? Um, and maybe we should 
I approach each one of those separately because I think they're two very, very different scenarios. So if you want to approach it from someone who just heard that they were diagnosed with cancer, um, what can they expect? So you, you want me to ask, answer as the cancer patient who just got yeah, diagnosed? please. Well, you're going to expect everyone to be weird around you. Yeah. They're not going to know what to say. They're going to think of you as a, a leper or a pariah, you know, and a, and a piece of broken glass or a piece of glass that can be broken very easily, hmm. you know, uh, and still to this day, I have that experience. Uh, and that is pretty much ubiquitous across the cancer experience. And one thing that I have, I have found is that, you know, they think of us as these very fragile beings the second you're diagnosed. And it's just not true, you know, and, and that's one thing that actually becomes very frustrating is that you end up being coddled a little bit and you get very frustrated about that, how people treat you and things. But at the end of the day, as I kind of alluded to earlier, no one knows what to do. No one knows what to say and no one will. Very few people will say the right thing. And what you need to remember though, is at the end of the day, it's coming from a place of kindness and love, hopefully, you know, and that really the people in your life that are trying to be there in your life really just want to help you. And they don't know how to. And so it's kind of this journey for everybody. You know, we, we, as cancer patients, we tend to think of it as our journey and no one else's. And we're the only ones on this, on this boat. Mm. But that's just not the case. And, you, you know, life, we don't live in a vacuum. We touch things, we touch people. And so those people, no matter how distant they are, come along for part of that journey. And so it's just a very bizarre time because again, you want to take care of yourself and you want to be selfish as you should be because you just had this horrible diagnosis. But like everything in life, we're not alone. And there are friends and family nearby us that want to be there, want to love us and take care of us. And they're not going to say the right things. And it's going to piss you off. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's not. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, that you're going to know what to say back to them because I still don't know what to say back to people other than it's okay. It's okay to not know what to say. And, you know, it's just going to be a very bizarre time. I can't describe it any other way than just simply bizarre. There is no uh, context in your life that has ever prepared you for what a cancer diagnosis will do to you. Um, it is truly reality shifting. Uh, the new normal isn't just the way that you live your life. It's the way that you view the world uh, as well as the way the world views you, views you at times as well. And let's use that experience that, that Stephen just described there as a segue or a jumping off point into part number, part two of our conversation today, which is a clear two-way communication and how that impacts uh, and that impact on support. So Nick, I want to turn things to you now. Um, you alluded to it a little bit with the first question, but um, did you become more cautious communicating with Steven during his first diagnosis? Um, and did you, or how did you get to a place where um, you're being more direct or honest or, you know, getting closer to that clear two-way communication. Yeah. So I wouldn't use the word cautious. I don't think we were ever um, cautious. Uh, cautious <laughs> is not in our family's nature, I don't think. Um, it, as far as, I mean, most, we, I think we were, Steve was also fortunate that he had a doctor that really was like, you know, if Steve wanted to know like prognosis and certain things, even though he was 15 for the first cancer, it's like, you know, yeah, we're going to tell Steve. Um, and even for when he was diagnosed the second time, right, Steve, if I do recall correctly, I think that was the case. Am I saying the opposite? I'm saying the opposite. Jesus. So clearly, see, this is what happens with trauma. Your brain just, um, but so incorrect. I'm going to, well, anyways, so <laughs> but no, from a family standpoint, we, we were never cautious with Steve. It may, but what, what we were not good at was I think listening to some of the things that Steve had said, right? Um, you know, so as you know, like as, as I saw my mom just chime in. Yeah. Um, the parents were very aware. Uh, Phil and I were very aware too. We we knew that. Um, so I guess we just didn't bring that up to Steve and um, 
yeah, I'm just going to jump over that part because clearly my memory is not what it was. But as far as just communicating with Steve, uh, you know, I, I think we just didn't listen a lot, especially the second cancer. The first cancer, I think we really were deer in a headlights as a family, just, you know, like anyone else that gets uh, a child has some sort of diagnosis. And um, the fact that Steve was the baby of the three brothers uh, and, you know, and it was a stage four cancer. So, you know, when you kind of factor in a lot of those things, you realize that this is pretty darn serious. So I think we really were all kind of just hurting along, like what the doctors say or what the medical professionals say, like, yeah, like we're, we're listening to that. But it was definitely more the, the second cancer where um, we were and even when Steve was done with the second cancer, trying to tell him how to live his life. Mm. Uh, I think that that was definitely you know, it's, it's no secret. It's well documented at Elephants and Tea that Steve and I, um, I, you know, we tried to, I tried to work with Steve almost like as a life coach or try to help him getting through with his undergraduate and stuff like that. And we butted heads big time uh, with that. And so it, it, it was for anyone that thinks that open line of communication is easy. It's not, it's necessary. Um, but it took a very long time for, for me um, and even still some family members to really, uh, you know, know how to communicate appropriately at times, uh, or even just to understand, I think, what Steve's going through. I mean, I think Steve always has the best, and I'm sure he's probably going to say it again tonight. It's like anyone that has not had a cancer themselves cannot possibly understand what the cancer patient is going through, or the survivor is going through. You just can't. Um, uh, you can be empathetic and sympathetic to what they're going through, but you truly cannot understand what they're going through, but also vice versa. It's tough for them to really understand what the sibling or the caregiver is going through. Um, and as someone who has a 15 month old kid now, uh, you don't realize there are emotions there as a parent until you have a kid. Mm. And I think that there is something to be said for that, for my parents or any other parents that have been through it. Uh, where their own child has uh, a, a significant illness of any kind, uh, especially cancer, right? So I realized I kind of botched your your question that you wanted me to respond to very right off the bat, but hopefully I picked it up from there for you. No, I I think that was a great response. And Kara, I want to loop you into this conversation, but first I wanna I wanna pivot back to Steven to get his perspective on that. How did you communicate back to to Nick around? the fact that you didn't need a life coach, you needed a brother. Uh, and well, before I answer that, to, to answer to, to Nick's point when he botched earlier, he might not have botched it. I was pretty drugged up and don't recall <laughs> a lot of the beginning of my diagnosis. So, uh, Fair. no, um, but to the life coach thing, you know, it was, obviously there was points of frustration, but knowing my brother, you know, it, again, it, it came from a place of love and concern, not necessarily, you know, uh, I didn't always, I mean, I, I knew deep down that he wanted the best for me. You know, it wasn't that he was telling me that I was wrong or I was doing things wrong, but he was trying to have a guiding hand more than he should have because of, well, not more than he should have. Uh, he tried to have a guiding hand in my life without understanding my life. Hmm. and it wasn't until my mom had him come to cancer con where it opened his it, it, he he began to understand me better by understanding the community better and you know but we we, we really did we butted we had some major headbutting moments because you know he'd be like why aren't you responding why aren't you doing these things why are you so forgetful well forget the fact that i was a depressed drug addict you know uh I also have severe chemo brain. I had two crazy cancers with that required huge amounts of chemotherapy, you know, and forget the trauma of being diagnosed at 15, relapsing, and then being diagnosed again at 18, you know, your brain just functions differently. And I'm severely ADHD, you know, just to sprinkle some, you know, uh, sugar on top, uh, you know, so at the time it was hard at the time I wanted to just kill him. You know, I was really mad because I was just like, why are you telling me to do these things? Why are you, you know, so trying to, you know, direct me as much as you were as, as he was. So that was a little directed too much at you there, Nick. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, but at the end of the day, 
it was out of love, you know? And so there's that, again, where I come back to that, it's that sense of kindness, understanding that he was trying to be helpful and just not understanding how to do it. And so we butted heads, but, you know, as time went on and we chipped away a little bit at those, what we were both trying to do from our lives, we were able to kind of come together and have a much better understanding of each other. Mm. Yeah. And your mom suggesting that he come to cancer con, that was a genius move. I don't know if mom's in the audience right now, but uh, kudos to her. So Kara, um, obviously your perspective, your experience is much different. Um, you have certain responsibilities as a health professional. I don't know how much experience you had with, um, with cancer prior to stepping into that role, but what did you learn, you know, maybe over that first year or so about communicating with the patients? Yeah, I think um, what Stephen and Nick touched on, uh, there's so much there that was so valuable. So one, I think um, having that patience with someone. So the cancer diagnosis, you know, there's it, everything's happening so fast. There's chemotherapy, there's radiation, there's surgery, and and it's never just the cancer. There's family dynamics that go into that, and then you know the way that the the medications, like Stephen mentioned, that affect your body. There's mood swings. You're uncomfortable. You have no privacy. You've lost all control, um, and so sometimes the patient. Um, needs that outlet. And a lot of times their family becomes that safe place where they can, you know, not, you know, just kind of lash out a little. And so I've, you know, caught a lot of parents in the hallways in tears and, you know, they're telling me, oh, my kid just kicked me out of the room and they don't want me here. And, mm. and I have to remind them of, of what the patient's going through. Their whole life has just been turned upside down. Um, they're, they've lost control over, everything. They have no privacy, no independence. And then you throw in all these medications on top of that. And you just, you don't know yourself anymore. And, and that's one way to kind of release some of that tension is, is on your parents or on your siblings. Um, and that can be really hard for the supporter to understand and to be patient with. And so I think there needs to be a lot of patience on both sides, a lot of communication, and just understanding that one day you may want one thing and then the next day it's going to completely change um, because this experience is constantly evolving and, and your perspective is evolving. Um, and so I think having those outlets, I think, you know, even the, the supporter, the caregivers, they need to have that safe person that they can unload on and that, and, and still maintain some of their, their normalcy as well. I think both the patient, the supporter, the parent, uh, the caregivers, they need to exercise, they need rest, they need nutrition, they need to maintain some normalcy um, because everyone's going to get tired and everyone's going to get frustrated um, and, and that's impossible to sustain. Um, and I think a lot of times you're going to see different people come to the table. You're going to see the people that just can't handle it. It's too hard. They're too emotional. This is overwhelming them and they, they step away. They just can't handle it. You're going to have the helpers that want to come in and, and do everything that they can and, and be super present and, and, you know, try to help in a lot of different ways, sometimes a little overbearing. Um, and sometimes it's fantastic. And then you're going to have the fixers, um, which sounds like Nick was that wants to come in and get to the root issue and and take care of business. Um, and so everyone's looking for a job. Everyone has a part to play. Um, this, it, this impacts not just the patient, it impacts their whole network. Um, and, I, and so I think finding ways to, to figure out what your role is in that um, and, and how involved you wanna be. But I think the, the patient needs to find a safe way to develop those boundaries and, and feel comfortable delegating. Um, and so I think there's two things that can happen. I think that the supporters and the caregivers need to um, know their boundaries and, and know what's overstepping and what's helpful um, and not just saying, hey, what can I do? How can I help? But just doing things and, and, and stepping in and, um, you know, sending a text, but not assuming you're going to get a response and being okay with that or, you know, taking the dog for a walk or doing laundry or, you know, 
sending a funny meme or, or something. There's, there's a wide spectrum of things that you can do. Um, but I think knowing those boundaries, um, same thing with visiting. One day, a patient may want a ton of visitors and they want to be social and they want that distraction and they want someone to come and sit and watch TV or play a board game with them. And then other times they're just not feeling up to it and they're tired and they're exhausted and the pressure of having to entertain their guests is really stressful. Um, and so just being flexible, knowing that day to day, this experience is going to change and, and being understanding and patient with that process is really important. Fair. Steven, um, what, what do you feel like, and, and I'll, I'll use your friend Gabby as an example. What do you, you feel like she did right compared to some of the other friends, um, that were in your life at that point in time? Oof. Um, honestly, she was just there, you know, uh, We'd come over and she had no expectations of what I could do or couldn't do. You know, it was, we would just hang out in the basement and we would just talk. We would just BS, you know, uh, we would, we gossip. We, you know, we would sit there and just, you know, talk about, I think at the time she was dating my, my good friend, Teddy. So, uh, you know, so we just talked about that and we just talked about her life a lot just to, you know, I don't really want to talk about mine because I just felt like shit, mm -hmm. you know? And so just having her there was really nice. Uh, and not that a lot of my other friends weren't there, but she was just there more, you know, she came to see me a lot, you know, and I don't recall her ever being pushy, you know, or ever trying to drag me out places or do things like that, you know, she'd offer. And if I gave an answer of no, it was, that was it, you know? So there was just an, it, it seemed like there was an understanding of, not even sure what the term is, but just an understanding of what I could and couldn't do. And the fact that, you know, there was never a push. She never forced me to do anything I didn't want to do. And she was just there. Yeah. And did you, do you, um, or did you prefer people to ask how you were doing whenever they saw you again, or kind of brush it under the, the, the rug a little bit? I, how would I approach you knowing that you have cancer I'm coming in. I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. Um, can I ask you how you're feeling or would you just prefer, you know, being like Gabby, I'm showing up and um, we're shooting the shit and we're, we're gossiping and we're talking about what's happening at school. You know, uh, during cancer, during, during the, the actual treatment, I didn't mind at all. I had no problem with people asking me how I was doing because, you know, they actually wanted to know. Yeah. It was when I was done with my first cancer and you know, really when I got to college, when I hadn't seen people for a year who I hadn't talked to or something, you know, and the first thing they always asked then was, well, how's, what's going on with like your health? Mm. You know, there was always that, whether they asked it directly or how are you doing? There was always that underlying, at least to me, sense of they wanted to know specifically about my health. And so post-cancer, that became more of, a frustration because all I wanted to do was to move on. You know, uh, my whole family can attest to the fact that it wasn't until after my second cancer and after losing a friend that I actually wanted to become an advocate. You know, I wanted to be done with this world. I wanted nothing to do with it. And so when, once I was done with my treatment, I wanted to be done. I wanted to, be, you know, back to a regular life as much as I could, you know, and being reminded constantly that I was different which at that point in my life really bothered me now. It doesn't. But at that point in my life, that question just always reminded me of how much I was different than everybody else. Mm. So it bothered me more after not really didn't not really bother me during. Yeah. And I, I saw the chat going there too. It looks like Alex and Liz both agree as well. If you're open and it's coming from a genuine place, it seems like it's a totally fair question to ask how you're doing. Um, but, uh, but, but Nick, um, I'm sure you, you know, being really involved in this space, being, um, uh, an avid supporter, I'm assuming you get this question a lot, but a piece of advice to give new supporters around communication, what would you share through, through your journey, your experience, um, either a hurdle that you had to overcome and a learning lesson that you can, you can kind of give back to somebody or anything else that you would like to provide? I think it just, 
you know, sums up the name of the organization that we're is hosting this, just be present. And I think that is, is that as, is, you know, to put it as, as short and sweet as possible, that's it. Just be there. Um, that's my short, short answer. My, my longer answer is I, I like how Liz put it. It's like when somebody, if you're going to ask the question, how they're doing, you're going to show up, then you need to listen uh, to what's actually then being said back to you. Um, and I'm going to call out Liz again, because I know she's said this a few times, but it's like, you know, you don't have to hold my hand too, I think is, is how like a patient would probably like to say back to people, like, it's okay for you just to sit there and just be there. That means enough to that person. The fact that you just showed up if they're in the hospital or not feeling well or whatever. Um, I think, I think Kara just said, like, if you, even if you send a text, that's great. They, they got the text. They just, if they aren't responding, don't be offended by no response. Right. Uh, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not about you. It's about the patient. Yeah. So as we segue into our last topic today, we're going to share a video. Um, this video is from Brené Brown. It's empathy versus sympathy. Actually, Kara, you shared it with us. Um, I would love before we kick this video out um, with all of your years of experience, um, you know, why did you, why do you feel like this is a great video to share for the audience? Yeah, so this was um, shown to me uh, when I was in kind of the trenches of patient care and, and navigating, you know, that cancer experience with a lot of patients and their families, and it's heavy, and there's a lot of ups and downs, and uh, I, you know, really was impacted by that, and there's this pressure to say the right thing and, and do the right thing, and so someone had shared this video with me um, as a support, and I can talk a little bit more about it afterwards, um, but it was just a big encouragement to me about uh, being, being present. Awesome. Well, let's, uh, let's share the video, and, um, and we can see what you're talking about. I love that video. <laughs> and I, and I think, um, you know, it's, it can work in so many different ways. And so for me, um, you know, working in the hospital, I wanted to fix it. I wanted to make all these patients and their families feel better. Um, and you know, this translates into other relationships too. Uh, you want to fix things. You want to make someone feel better. You want to be that person that comes in and saves the day. Uh, but that's not what they're looking for. This is hard. And, and you don't need people to silver lining it. You need people to be with you in it and to be present, which is what be present is all about is, is just showing up and, and being there and listening. And um, you don't have to say the right thing. You're probably going to say the wrong thing. And, and that's okay too. And so it's about being understanding and, um, you know, and I think too, you may not understand the cancer experience. Um, I think, you know, what Mama G did by sending you to CancerCon is huge. I think, you know, leaning into the, the hospital and finding social workers or child life specialists or someone to educate uh, your supporters on what's going on is great. That's going to be very helpful and it will be eye opening. Um, and so taking the time to try to understand, but also being okay if you don't. And, um, and just knowing that you're best asset, the best thing that you can do for someone is to show up and be present um, and, and just be there. Mm. That's really good. And thanks for sharing that video with us. I've, I've heard that talk before. It's amazing. Um, Brene Brown has some amazing work out there. If people haven't explored her more, um, I'd really dive deep on her. Um, so that I think sets the stage for our final topic for tonight. And that's setting up a network and staying strong together. So Stephen, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, as a four-time cancer survivor, I'm assuming your experience and your need for support was different each time. So talk to us about what what your support needs were over that time and how you communicated to your friends and family. Oh gosh. Uh, so you know, when I was 15, it was a lot. E you know, it was a lot easier to be quite frank. You know, um, all I had to do was live. And, uh, you know, occasionally go to school and pretend to do schoolwork. Uh, my guidance counselor did a lot of it for me. Uh, <laughs> and so my support was just, you know, honestly, going to school was a support for me. Having friends, just being around people, you know, and getting to do things was nice. Uh, 
but as I got older, that support, those support needs dramatically changed. And really after my second cancer, they really, really changed because the one thing, you know, and, and each cancer is different. You know, with my first cancer, when I was done with treatment, I was done. You know, I, once the physical wounds healed for the most part, I was, I was done. And obviously there's the mental things to deal with, but it was after the second cancer, which was leukemia and a bone marrow transplant, where I was dealing with my immune cells not having a good day and wanting to attack me because they weren't really mine to begin with. And, and depression really set in, you know, depression and addiction. And it becomes this, uh, this battle because, yeah, your supporters want to be there for you and you want them. I mean, and, and you want to be supported, but at the same time, you also don't know what you want. You know, there's this sense of, you know, we talk about clear communication and being able to have these conversations, but at the end of the day, you know, one, am I going to remember the conversation that we had? And that was one of the big issues that really began to happen is that because of the narcotic use that I had, the chemo brain, the ADHD, you know, I know there would be conversations with my brother and my mom who were being very supportive and I just wouldn't remember the conversations at all. And I'm like, why didn't you do this? You know, and so I know that's a little tangential there, but it shaped my support. And what really it came to was, you know, I could call my mom and my dad at any time and talk to them. And that was really wonderful. But that was also one of the biggest changes for me is that my parents were with me all the time in the hospital and we became like best friends. And so that had to change. And that was a whole different experience in trying to structure the support from going, being friends to now being true mother, father, son. And there was a lot of frustrations in, in how, and how all of us can, could change. And as I got, as I continued to go through my twenties, you know, the support that I really needed really went back to less of my friends and my family and more to the medical side and the psychiatric side, because, you know, you're never going to heal from any trauma unless you have proper mental health care. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you believe. If you've had a trauma, you most likely need some form of mental health care. I'm not saying you need medication or things, but you need to have a space where you can learn to heal and to forgive yourself. And that would be the biggest thing of support that I came, wasn't so much the support from my friends and my family, it was the support that I needed from myself internally. You know, the forgiveness I needed to give myself for not being as far along in school or in my life, you know, not having a girlfriend, not being married, um, and just not being who I envisioned as a 15, 16, 17 year old man being when I got to my 20s. And it wasn't until that stage of my life where I really began to get the help that I needed and began to look back at my own life. And I say critically here, but in the sense of an honest critique. And the, so the support that I gained was the support from me you know, and obviously, as, as we've alluded to earlier, not alluded to, we've talked about with how my, my, my brother's support for me has, has changed over the years. And that was extremely important for, for it to become what it is now. But for me to become a healthy adult, I needed to be able to look at myself in a healthy light. And that was the biggest thing of support that changed is that, yeah, it's nice to have everyone there around you to help you. But at the end of the day, when you're home alone in your apartment or your house, it's only you. And so how do you deal with those things? How do you support yourself when you can't reach out to someone else? And that was the biggest learning curve that I had was that, you know, I had had so much support as a young adult, as a, as a teenager, as a young man. And now I was at a point in my life where I needed to grow up and I needed to understand how to deal with problems on my own. You know, if I'm having a sad day, how do I deal with that? You know, if there's no one to hang out with or no one to call, am I going to take narcotics? Or am I going to play piano? Am I going to go for a walk? Am I going to garden? Am I going to learn the things that make me happy? And it's a hard conversation to have with yourself because sometimes you don't like the answers that you find when you're trying to figure out what you need in your own life. And so when it comes to support as you go along, your support system will never be good unless you know internally what you want, what you need, who you are. Because again, it's like your support has a, um, a moving target. You know, until you have a better understanding of who you are 
and what your needs are and how you can support yourself, they're never going to be able to support you in the best way possible. The reason we're able to have this um, dialogue now with our family is because I have learned and owned up to my own, I hate the word failings because it's not really failings, but the things that have developed in my life and, and being honest with myself and where I am mentally, physically, scholastically, and being okay with that. Because then once I'm okay with it, then it was easier for my family and my friends to have conversations with me and be able to be there for me because I knew that I didn't know. And when you know that you don't know what you need, and I guess it seems kind of weird to say that, it makes it a lot easier because you can be honest with them and saying, I don't know what I need today, you know, um, but I know that you being here is nice. And so it's this sense of knowing, you know, internal, I guess it kind of has two contradictory things there, knowing what, you know, um, but it really, uh, for me, my support changed from the support of my family and my friends to the support of myself, supporting myself in hard situations, and then having the, the sprinkling on the top of the friends and the family to help continue to lift me up. I don't know if that answered the question or not, Justin. It was kind of long-winded, but... No, no, I appreciate that. I think there was a lot of honesty in that answer, um, and that was really challenging. Nick, I would love to hear what you were thinking about whenever you were just listening to Stephen right there. I can only imagine from the older brother role how frustrating... Um, not knowing how you could support Steven um, might be, but seeing the inside of what he's talking about now, living through that moment, what, what were your thoughts or what are your thoughts now? Well, and, and honestly, Justin, we didn't really know that till I didn't realize a lot of what Steve just said till two years ago, three years ago, right? When, when it was, when you went to cancer kind of, you realized that, oh, chemo brain is a thing. And, oh, there are other mental health issues going on with patients and survivors, right? And I think that, honestly, at the time, it was more of just like blaming Steve's ADHD or for being forgetful. So, you know, that, because a lot of like what Steve said, we didn't really realize was even going on at the time, um, for better, for worse, I guess. Um, you know, and I partially shame on us for not realizing it, but also too, it's crazy because like even Steve said, like Steve didn't realize that at the time uh, with some of the, the, the things that were going on. And um, it, it is wild that, you know, you don't realize some of the things that your loved one's going through, your siblings going through at the time. So, you know, a lot of those things really didn't realize it. I uh, was definitely embarrassed after we went to CancerCon um, and, and could realize that, you know, probably shouldn't have been just like pounding Steve over the backside of his head to, you know, do what the normal is of society to get your graduate degree by the time you're 24 years old and, you know, be married by the time you're 30, if that's even a thing, I don't even know. Um, but you know what I mean? Like being, I, I, I feel like as a family and even as Steve, we were trying to meet expectations of what society views, uh, a straight male, if you will, right? I guess, um, but and it's like, who, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, at the end of the day, like, what is the norm of society? I know some people probably like it's a big deal. To, it is a big deal to get your undergraduate. Don't get me wrong, or your bachelor's degree. But at the same time, like in the grand scheme of things, who cares? So, um, you know, so it's it was, yeah, you know, it's again, cancer count was a big eye opener for me. So again, a lot of things that Steve went through, you know, was definitely embarrassed when we realized that it, it he wasn't the only one going through it, I guess is to sum that up. Yeah. Kara, um, let's turn to you. You've gotten kind of a peek at probably all the different spectrums with, with the patients that you serve. Um, the ones that have had great support, the ones that are lacking support. What are what are some of the differences that you see between those two parties? Um, I think that uh, 
yes, I've walked into rooms where the walls are covered with pictures and decorations and, you know, uh, they constantly have visitors, they constantly have food being dropped off and, um, you know, activities and, and, and things going on in their rooms. And then I've had the others that, you know, there's really no one there. And, and maybe it's because parents are working and and they're busy, there's other kids at home, um, or, you know, the relationships just slowly start to drop off, especially, you know, towards the end of treatment, especially if there's multiple reoccurrences, I feel like the, this, I've seen the support network slowly start to, to drop off. Um, and it's hard, it, it's hard as the, the healthcare professional, um, you know, and, and maybe this is too much to share, but I've been to a few funerals where I could feel that resentment inside of me um, when there's so many people at the funeral. And I just think, where were you? Where, where were you the last few months? I haven't seen any of you. Um, and that's an ugly feeling. And it, it's hard for me to even say that out loud. I don't know if I've ever shared that before, but um, it, 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 it's hard to process. And I think that I have to be understanding of, um, of how long the journey is and, and how, how taxing it is on both the patient and the family and the supporters. And, and so I think um, maintaining that communication, but really maintaining that engagement and finding creative ways to stay connected, um, whether that's, you know, I have a friend that, that has been in and out of the hospital and, um, and we found ways like watching the same show at the same time and, you know, we'll say, okay, go. And, and that's one, you know, small way to stay connected or, you know, classrooms that have saved a seat for, for that person and, you know, hung up a Jersey or put a stuffed animal in that chair as cheesy as it sounds. I think making sure that the patient, the survivor knows that they are still a part of everything and they are still included um, is really important and, and maintaining that communication and, um, and being in it for the long haul. Um, and you may lose a few people along the way um, and, and that's hard, that's hard to cope with. I've seen a lot of breakups. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of friends that have stepped away because it was too hard or they moved away to school. And, you know, it, it takes work. Relationships take work, whether you are in the hospital or you have a cancer diagnosis or not. Um, I think really uh, taking the time to invest in those relationships relationships is really important and, and finding creative ways to stay connected. Thanks for sharing that, Kara. We're going to transition to Q&A here soon. So please, if you have questions for any three of these panelists, fire them away in the, the, the chat right now. We'll get those teed up. Um, but I want to give um, the, the final few minutes of this conversation to Stephen. I know you had some thoughts around communication and empathy. Um, can you bring us home in this, this conversation with your thoughts around that? Yeah. You know, so this is, you know, pretty, this is directed at cancer patients. And, and the reason why I say that is because we have a tendency as, as patients or survivors, you know, to have our singular view of the world as, as a patient. And when it comes to communication and empathy, it's a two way street. And as my brother alluded to earlier, you know, not alluded to, he straight up said earlier, he will not understand what it's like for me to go, you know, to go through cancer, but I will never understand what it's like to be him or my parents. Mm. And, and this is where the empathy comes in, in terms of communication, just understanding that you're not going to understand anyone's situation at all until you live in their shoes. And sometimes that's impossible. And I'm just reminded of two moments, you know, where my, uh, Nick's daughter, my niece, there was a, a, an, an issue when she was being born. Thankfully, she's uh, all all healthy and okay. And um, and both my parents had COVID this past year. And during both of those times, all I wanted to do was be the patient. All I wanted to do was be that person in the bed because obviously, when you're throwing up, bent over a toilet from chemo, that sucks. But most of the time, from my experience, you know, it is easier to be the patient, easier to be the person going through the experience because at the end of the day you at least know how you feel mm -hmm. and i can't imagine what my brothers or my parents saw you know when they saw me at 114 pounds that you know 
post back surgery or, you know, no hair and looking like, you know, an emaciated mess. And so what I would remind all the cancer patients out there is that empathy and kindness will fix any relationship issues that you have with your family, your friends, or your siblings. They're never going to say the right thing and you're never going to say the right thing to them. Just as, as uh, I have told people before, be humble in one's ignorance for all aspects of life. I think that's some great closing thoughts on this panel. I think it sums up and I, I wrote it down in Hernan's video right here. Um, someone in that video said perseverance, not perfection. And I thought that was just a great piece of advice, you know, stick in there, hang around, continue to give it, you know, all your all and put in the effort. It's never going to be perfect. You're going to say the wrong thing sometimes. Um, and I can tell from, from all your responses, you all have experienced that, that um, as either the, the receiver or the giver in that sense. So we're going to turn things over to Q and a here. Um, I, I know you guys were a chatty bunch in the Q and a uh, saying, saying your thoughts. So please uh, post some, post some questions for, for Nick, Steven or Kara. You can direct them at, at one of them or all three of them. Um, we're really excited to, to hear what your thoughts are on this webinar. So chime in here. And um, why don't, as that's getting queued up here, why don't we quickly go around, give your 20, 20 to 30 second final piece of advice um, from your role you know, as a health professional, as a supporter, um, as a cancer survivor. I'd love to hear you know, if somebody is, is in your spot um, right now, like what would you say to them? Nick, you want to start things off for us? I know. Yeah. So the, the two, I just a quick wrap up 20 seconds from a yeah. supporter standpoint, again, just reiterating, be there, be present. Uh, you know, that's Kara struck a lot of nerves of, of how she mentioned when you go to a funeral and you just like go, where have you all been for this person? Um, I can't stress that enough. Just show up, just text, you know, don't, for the love, don't overthink a text, like just reach out. Um, I think that, that just being there present, whether, whether it's through the phone, whether it's in person, be there, be present as much as possible. Awesome. Be present and don't be afraid to just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Kara, how about you? Yeah, I think same, be, be present, be patient so that it's going to keep changing. I think both the patient and, and the supporter needs to be forgiving um, because like Steven said, you're going to say the wrong thing, you're going to do the wrong thing. But I think keep showing up, even if you know, you're know you not getting a response, um, be patient with that and, and know that they know you're there and they're going to lean on you when they're ready. Um, but but just wait for that moment and and don't, interject until they're ready, um, but just be present. Let them know that you're there. Awesome. And Stephen? Yeah, the last little bit of advice that I could have is kind of what I you know, said before is, you know, and kind of what Kara said, you know, Kara said as well is patience, you know, uh, patience with your friends, patience with your family, uh, they're not going to understand you and you're not going to understand them and patience and kindness as much as you're able to, even when you feel like crap, you know, it's okay to come back later on and say, I'm sorry. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sorry is a good one. Mm -hmm. I think we could all take something away from that. <laughs> so I'm going to invite up our, our founder, be present, Abby. Um, Abby, if you could come on stage, I know you're monitoring the, the Q and a, so if there's any questions in the Q and A, um, can you dish those out? And then I know you have some final thoughts, um, some things to share with the audience as well. Yeah, so we do have uh, one question that uh, just popped in the Q and A and it's uh, from Alex. So Stephen, I was diagnosed with leukemia at 15 and then relapsed at 21 and I had a bone marrow transplant. I'm healthy now, but do you ever have the fear of it returning? I am fine a lot of the time, but I feel like that thought always has a way of creeping back for me. Uh, most definitely, most definitely, Alex, you know, uh, to expand a little bit on my story to explain, after having leukemia, I was cancer-free for 11 years, you know, and thought, I'm in the wind, you know, I'm 10 years out, life's good, you know. Uh, 
even though obviously even then still in the back of my head, you know, I thought this could come back, you know, um, and unfortunately it did. Now I have some wonky genes, a little bit different than, you know, the, the average uh, cancer patient out there, but it's, you know, uh, that fear is, that fear will probably always be there in some way, shape or another. And the best thing I can say is, you know, at some point, you know, I hope that you find a way to push it aside enough to live your life, you know, um, because for me, it's still in the back of my head. And obviously getting diagnosed with my third and my fourth cancer, it is in the forefront of my head now, you know, uh, but you have to try and enjoy life as much as possible. And, you know, and the feeling just, it, it will be there. And any cancer patient will tell you that it is there. So we, we also had that uh, another question that actually came in when we had people registering. And um, I'll let uh, you guys decide who gets to answer it. But the question was, what do friends or family want to hear from a supportive friend or family member versus what they need to hear? I, I think kind of, Kind of what I what I was saying for at least from my end is you know what they want to hear what they want to hear versus what they should hear is again show up and don't be afraid to shut up. <laughs> That's my opinion. I think um, not adding to the stress of uh, of what they're already being told. Um, so giving suggestions on what they should eat or drink or you know, wear, sleep, you know, do. Uh, I, I think it's just a lot that they're getting. And, and so if it's something you read online, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> or, uh, you know, I know it's all coming from a loving place, um, but I think it is uh, patients receive an overwhelming amount of opinions. Um, and there's already that, that stress of feeling like they did something wrong or this is their fault. And um, you need to remind them that they didn't do anything wrong. This isn't their fault. And this really sucks that this happened, um, but I'm gonna be with you in that. And I'm gonna show up and, and, and what do you need from me? You know, is it, and what am I in charge of food or am I in charge of, you know, funny jokes? Am I in charge of, you know, uh, keeping your Netflix lineup strong? You know, what, what is it? And so I think uh, finding your place and, and knowing what that is, uh, but not adding to the burden. Um, and, uh, and again, just be present and show up and be there. Um, it's not about saying the right thing or doing the right thing. It's, it's just about being there. Yeah, and uh, it's very well said. And I, I feel like too that, um, you know, sometimes when we, we introduce those stressors that, um, you know, trying to read the body language and, and uh, be aware of, of uh, how they're responding to it and, you know, being present with yourself and not having those distractions to, to really take away from your ability to, to, to be in the moment with them, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here in the, in the chat, uh, somebody, oh, Angie said, you know, let the patient set the tone. And that's absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's what you guys have been saying for sure. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions that I've seen in the chat or uh, the, the Q&A. So Abby, how about um, we give Nick, Steve, and Kara the opportunity to share the best place to get in contact if somebody in the audience or somebody listening to the, the webinar after this wants to reach out, has some further questions, would love to have a conversation. Where, where would you guys point them to? Nick, how about you? You kick things off for us. Yeah, anyone's free to email me, uh, nick at elephantsandtea.com. Cool. And um, elephantsandtea.com is the website? Correct. Awesome. Steven? Uh, if you search my name on Instagram or Facebook, uh, that's honestly the best way to reach out to me. Uh, Instagram is, you know, my, if you want a quick response, that's the one that I, I check most regularly. Uh, and my, uh, yeah, that, that would be, that would be the best, uh, tr truthfully. I, I monitor that pretty closely. Uh, yeah. 
Awesome. And Kara, how about you? And you can email me directly at Kara at teencanceramerica.org. Um, and, you know, I would love to connect you with uh, the hospital in your region or a nonprofit in your region if you're looking for something specific. Um, both Teen Cancer America and Elephants in Tea and Be Present are, are very collaborative and supportive. And, and we work with a lot of different hospitals, healthcare professionals, uh, and, and nonprofit organizations all across the country. Um, and there's, there's really a wide range of people out there that are um, specifically here to support you at, at different stages of your cancer experience. And, and I think, you know, going back to the education piece, the more knowledge you have the more prepared you'll be um, to be to be a good supporter and so we, we'd be happy to connect you with the right people awesome it's been such an honor uh being a part of this conversation and helping drive this conversation i'm on stage with three amazing people um i i've loved our interactions for for anyone that's wanting to get a little bit more taste of nick or kara they have both been on the support report podcast. So you can go find one of their episodes, Stephen. we're going to have to get you on at some point in time as well. Um, and, um, you know, I, I really appreciate you guys being candid and honest and, and being so giving with, with all of your thoughts. Um, so Abby, uh, I'll, I'll turn the last couple of minutes over to you. I know, um, this is one of many upcoming webinars, so I'd love to hear what's in store for the rest of the summer. Thank you, Justin. So yeah, I would just like to, before I get into that, also extend my thanks to everybody on the panel. Um, more wonderful than I could have ever imagined. And all of you bring such a rich perspective from all of the different um, experiences you've had over the years. And uh, so I, I really appreciate you making the time. And, and I really feel like it's going to be helpful for, for other folks to hear that because when we're in the dark, just having a little glimmer of light really, I think, helps a lot, at least to give us things to think about. And so that was what the purpose of this first webinar. So this is the first webinar in a series, and it's really, it's focused on the support network, but I think everybody has something to benefit from it. You know, as we experience tonight, everybody comes with a different perspective. And, and I think by hearing everybody's perspective, it helps us be a little more empathetic towards the others, like Stephen was pointing out, you know, really finding that kindness and understanding, because we it typically is done out of a place of love. Um, and so tonight was really to give you that overview from a support perspective of, you know, if we if we're afraid to, to, to of what the future holds, you know, knowledge helps kind of reduce that that fear. And uh, if we have no idea what to do or say, you know, figuring that out, but knowing that the number one thing is to be honest and, and direct with your communications because none of us are mind readers. And then the third is just creating that authentic support system that really leverages whatever your strengths are, or your friend's strengths are. And so we kind of touched on all those in a wonderful conversation. And so the next three webinars, we have one uh, planned the third Wednesday of every month uh, at 5 p.m., just like we started tonight. And so the next three are gonna really be diving down into the three topics that we covered uh, today in the conversation. So give, um, giving a little bit more information about just the AYA cancer experience and what to expect. And then we have a webinar um, that follows that in July that'll be really about the two-way communication and some strategies there and techniques and some pitfalls that we all uh, tend to, to fall into and just great reminders for, for how to navigate that difficult uh, interaction. And then the, 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 the fourth one, which will be in August is um, really covering the support network and how you define and understand what that support is. Because again, Stephen was saying, you know, every time it was a little bit different and every person is gonna have a different set of needs based on their unique uh, experience and cancer and uh, network of friends and family around them. And so it's really about finding and defining what it is they need and, and how you can be supportive and then matching that with your strengths. And so kind of going through that process and finding some of the tools and resources out there to help with that. And then we have a whole host of other ones that we've got lined up, but that's really for the next, the next three months subsequent to this one, uh, what we've got lined up. And, and I, 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 like I said, I can't imagine a better way to, to tee it all off than to have the wonderful panelists that we had tonight. So thank you so much. And of course, thank you to Justin. He works magic uh, with his conversations and uh, I'm just so grateful he has his own 
podcast, uh, The Struggle is Real. So uh, you, you should look them up too if you ever have, have the chance. But uh, thanks again to everyone and for everybody in the audience too. I appreciate you sticking with us and I hope this has been helpful. Um, we will be sending out a, um, a follow-up email. I would love to have your feedback, where we can improve, what other topics you'd like to hear. Uh, so uh, as we said tonight, honesty is important and it is with the feedback too. So I look forward to your, your uh, comments and feedback there. And uh, I think that's all I have, Justin. So if no other um, thoughts or comments, I think we're gonna go ahead and probably wrap it up and uh, let everybody get back to their evenings and especially the people on the East Coast, you can get to bed now. It's what, what it's 9.30. Sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, thank you for having us, Abby. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>